Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to another episode of LinkedIn Live Office Hours. I'm your host, Robbie Kelman Baxter. Thank you for tuning in. Um, today, we're talking about retention and acquisition with my special guest, Gabriella Gabby Teigen, the CEO and co-founder of Smarter, the leading brand loyalty platform for Shopify brands. We're going to talk about how to turn one-time purchasers into subscribers, um, how to provide best practices, um, and dishing out some real-world examples of brands that are creating a customer experience that you know, lasts a lifetime. So um, welcome. Thank you so much. So excited. Yeah. yeah, I'm so glad to have you here. So just for context, can you kind of explain why you started Smarter and what Smarter does and for whom in like 30 seconds or less? Yes. Just give us a I started the company because I learned very quickly during COVID that businesses were struggling um, on the retail side. They needed to find a solution that would keep them alive for the what we thought at the time was a couple months of COVID. It then snowballed into such a bigger project, which is really around how do we transform what that buyer's journey is in the same way that brick and mortar was able to do for shoppers? So how are we translating the relationship that you would have had in traditional retail to that online journey? And that we do through subscriptions, memberships, uh, through loyalty and community. Awesome. And what is the what do you think is the hardest thing um, if you're trying to to take that brick and mortar experience and put it online? What is what is hard about that? The personalization, right? I, I don't know, Robbie, if this if this is you know something that you can relate to, but I know growing up in New York, we would go to Bloomingdale's or Saks and go to the makeup floor, right? I used to go with my mom, and uh, just that connection where that person at the counter is telling you that the lipstick shade is made for you, that that blush is your right tone. That type of personalization is really, really challenging to replicate online, but when done successfully, is really impactful for the business. Okay, so let's 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 break it down. Um, you know, we called our session today. You know, it's from the moment of acquisition. So, if we start all the way at the beginning, um, with our goal being retention, how do you build that experience that you just described online? Um, starting starting from the from the very beginning, how would how would you think about that if you're if you're a merchant? Yeah. So the first caveat that I'll say is. There's no one size fits all. There's no cheat where if you do one, two, three, you have a billion dollar business. And I'm sure anyone that's listening to this that has a business knows that to be true. So I'm not going to claim that there are you know three magical steps. But um, I think what we have seen be most successful for our brands, one is kind of exactly that, not following one size fits all. So we try to develop the platform to allow for many different customizations. So if a brand has a traditional consumer, you know, replenishable product like toilet paper, they might offer a monthly and a quarterly subscription uh, and they want to keep it simple. Whereas some of our brands that are looking for more sophisticated build a box, bundle options, maybe a tiered reward system, they're able to do that too. And the point is that it's unique to that brand. So the first thing I would say is to really take a look at what product you're selling, who your clients are and build backwards, if that almost makes sense. And I know that that's not the traditional feedback that that people usually hear, but that's what I would say is really go with what your brand, uh, what will resonate with your consumer. So yeah. that might mean a custom experience in terms of what their subscription offering is. And then it's world is your oyster post sale. It's that customer portal where you go in to check your points, your status, you redeem, you refer, and then obviously you manage your subscription too. So can you give an example of somebody who does this really well? Oh my God. Um, absolutely. In fact, Lalo yesterday launched uh, a new offering. So Lalo, for those of you who are parents, I'm sure <laughs> recent parents have definitely seen them. They're all over. Um, I recently had a baby at the end of last year and they come up on every search that I ever do for baby products. So kudos to them. Yesterday they launched a child uh, toy subscription box. And if you go through that journey, you will feel like your hand is being held. So that's definitely one example I'll give. Yeah, I love that. I love that. I'm going to take a minute now and just um, welcome people um, to the show. Um, Richard, Shay, Mohammed, Tim, 
Um, if you're if you're just joining us now, please um, introduce yourself in the comments and um, feel free if you have questions for Gaddy. Or for Gaddy. Um, totally feel free to just jump in jump in with any questions that you may have, and we'll do our best uh, to answer them to answer them all live. This is of course going to also be available uh, in recorded form uh, after after the live is over. So if you miss anything, you can get the whole thing later. But the advantage of being here now is that you can join the conversation. So. So please, please uh, join us and uh, and ask whatever questions you you might have about retention, about building a personalized experience, um, about the the challenges that you're facing relating to um, you know building uh, and maximizing lifetime customer value with the customers and subscribers you serve. So okay, back to Gabby. Um, let's talk about churn. What yeah. are some of the drivers of churn that you see? With companies like Lavo and um, you know both you know subscription boxes, replenishment models, um, what are what are the things that you see that um, that cause churn? Yeah. So the first thing I'll say is an angry customer is worse than no customer. Uh, and what I mean by that is oftentimes, and especially when we were first doing our research on Smarter and what it could be, and now every day that we talk to brands, uh, there is this misnomer I want to say of subscribe and forget. You don't want your consumer to know that they have a subscription because you want to keep billing them. You don't want to make it easy for them to cancel. And I would say that's definitely the, the no ironically, it is ironic, but it is the number one reason for churn. It's because customers don't feel like they can trust their brand. It doesn't feel like a easy experience. And so that's the first thing is just making your experience easier for the consumer to do what they want. Again, yeah. an angry that customer is, is worse than no customer. Yeah, I, I love that. The, the angry customer, you know, who feels like they've been cheated. But even it sounds like you're talking about not just the angry customer, but also the mistrustful customer, the one who's like got one finger on the cancel button. Like, you know, whenever I sign up for a new subscription, I always make a note in my calendar, you know, cancel by in order to avoid paying. And then I have it for like the first two or three months. I just make a note because I don't want to forget because I don't I don't trust them. And I also don't trust myself. Like I don't, I'm not sure that I am going to get the value that I'm entitled to. Um, and so I just want to remind myself a few times before, like I think about this idea of, you know, the, the the subscriber relaxes into the relationship at some point where they say, you know what, I'm not going to think about this anymore. I'm not, I'm going to take off my consumer hat. I'm going to put on a member hat and I'm going to relax into this trusted ongoing experience, which is honestly like I've been a subscriber to Netflix for like 20 plus years. And I, the, you know, price increases notwithstanding, I have not thought seriously about canceling it since, you know, three months into it. Um, so, yeah, so trust and anger um, are two big, I think, two big drivers, drivers of churn, I think, especially in the early in the early periods. Have you seen that? Absolutely. I think the other one that we would be remiss not to mention is um churn is not always caused by something that the product did wrong or something that the brand did wrong. It's not always poor trust or bad communication. It can just be that they might not need the product that month. So that's another one I want to point out. It's not always the bad. Sometimes it's just someone doesn't need the product yet. Someone doesn't need the product during the summer. And so that's not you know, that's not something to be upset about is my point. Yeah. Yes, that might not be the best for retention for the business, but there are ways around that. So one of the things that we did was develop loyalty within the platform. So instead of canceling, you now have an incentive for the consumer to keep their subscription, even if it's on pause, even if it's just delayed for a couple months until they need the product again. But that way they still have their points. They're still a member. They still have that VIP experience. So that's what I would counter with is just, it's not just bad. Sometimes the reasons are okay. They're, they're not something to be you know running away from and we can help support that one when and if that comes. Yeah. Th I think this is such a good point, Gabby, it, because, um, I think, you know, there's acceptable churn. There's, I think of four categories of churn. There's acceptable churn and unacceptable churn. Unacceptable, if, you know, unacceptable from the company's perspective. If somebody leads, leaves because we messed up, that is unacceptable. Like we as leaders in the organization need to go fix that. Um, if somebody leaves because they find a better alternative to what we say we do for them, that that's unacceptable. We need to fix that. If they leave because they misunderstood what the offering was, we need to fix that. 
but if they leave because you know it's you know basketball products and it's not basketball season that's acceptable if they if they leave briefly because they went on vacation and now they have too much product um, or they're not going to need their food products they'll go bad while they're gone that's totally acceptable and we need to both um, accommodate that and understand it so that we can differentiate between that and what I think of as you know the unacceptable churn and then there's also the the difference between uh, active and passive churn, which I'm sure most of you, uh, you know, pros watching are very familiar with the passive churn, which is the customer never really intended to cancel their subscription, um, but something happened with the payment uh, that uh, that bounced them out. They they didn't mean to cancel, but their credit card changed, their credit card got stolen, they got a new one. Something happened with the processing system, and they never you know followed up to fix it. Um, so I think you know your point about acceptable churn is is a really important one and how do you like with your loyalty program how do you manage that um during the you know the off season or the i have too much give me a pause uh, i'm too busy give me a pause how do you how do you manage that it's an interesting question so first off i'll say when we talk about things like retention churn uh growth month over month even stats on failed payments one of the things that's so interesting to me about running a business and helping so many brands with their businesses is, you know, just from partnership is data can be sliced and diced a million different ways. And so one thing I was talking to a brand earlier this week about was actually their failed payments. Um, and they had a small spike and we were going through why that would have happened. One of the things that we offer, for example, is uh, ahead of a credit card expiring, Smarter can send an email to Robbie saying, by the way, your credit card is about to expire click here to update your payment info to, you know, avoid any kind of disruption to your subscription. Um, that is kind of, when you talk about passive trend, that's like the worst thing because they don't even know that their credit card is expiring. They forgot to update their address, whatever it is, you want to make it really easy for them to, to, to remember to do those things. So, um, that's one point on that. And then specifically on loyalty, it's it's really a matter of when you talk about slicing and dicing the data, a lot of brands, when something is paused or delayed, that's still to them an active subscription. And so what we're really trying to mitigate there is, is it still an active subscription? Does the brand want that to count as an active subscription? And if so, we keep their account on so that points are still generating when applicable or just their balance still exists. If they cancel their subscription, then they lose their balance. And so that's what we see as a main driver for pausing, changing dates rather than just canceling, which obviously affect your numbers more significantly. Yeah, that's that's really, I think, an emerging um, question right now with a lot of a lot of merchants is what to do with with pause and how to treat people who are pausing. Are they taking advantage and gaming the system? Like I'm going to subscribe and I'm going to subscribe one time a year you know, instead of taking my monthly subscription so that I can get the subscription price without having to actually commit to the volume. But on the other hand, we do want to, ex I mean, this is like the challenge when you're designing your offering is you want to design it so it's flexible for real world situations, but that it protects you from people who are, you know, trying to game the system. Yeah. And and I think there's two ways to game the system, right? There's the consumer gaming it in some ways. And then there's also the brands that can game, to your point, what is pause? Where does that fall? Um, so I think both of those are interesting. I see one of the questions we're getting is around uh, annual subscriptions. And just to quickly touch on that, I think it so depends on your product. It is not something that you can say black and white works or doesn't work in the D2C space. But certainly if you have a product that you see people are gifting, um, if you see that people are coming back month over month, you should try, if you're willing to part ways with some of your margin, yes, that is a wonderful rabbit hole to fall into. What I will say is that it does affect your margin because annual we have seen does require more of that discount commitment for sure. Yeah. So um, I put Rakesh Shumar's, um question up on the on the screen so people can see it. It's a great question. And I think there were a couple other people that were in. Kelly Pratt was also interested in this question. Um, I think you're you're totally right. The, the answer, I mean, I'm a consultant. The answer is always it depends. Um, but but, you know, in this, you know, when you think about yearly versus monthly, um, the things to consider. So people generally stay longer if it's annual. And part of that is because you know, boom, you, you pay for 12 months, so you're not going to leave in six months. 
Um, part of it is though that people who subscribe annually are usually people who have the intention of staying with you. They're much more likely to have already taken off their consumer hat and put on the member hat and say, this is something that makes sense to me, that I'm committed to, that's gonna be part of my new normal, part of my habits. Um, and so I'm gonna stick with it. Um, a challenge is you're going to probably get less margin. So you do have to believe that they're going to stay longer or that there's going to be other value or that you're going to make it up in, in volume. Um, and well, I mean, I, I don't know how you've, if you've seen this, Gabby, but something that I've seen is that uh, discount for, for commitment is probably the, the first, you know, box check, right? You know, 10% off for an annual subscription or what have you. Um, but then there's there's a lot of other ways you can layer in value. You can have um, early access to products. Uh, you can have faster shipping. You can have um, special gifts. You can have special events, community insider events. Um, so I would encourage you if you are thinking about annual versus monthly um, to, to think about the, the the pricing differential. You know, go annual for savings as just table stakes. And then think about what, you know, back to your point, uh, Gabby, about, you know, each company should really think about their own onboarding experience, their own member experience, making it unique. I think it's the same with, you know, what do you put into your annual offer? And one last thing on that, because I do think it's such an important conversation. It's a real driver for some of our businesses. Some of our brands, 80% of their business is on annual subscription. So it can definitely be a very powerful tool. I think Matthew has an interesting point on uh, monthly being a good, basically gauge, a good reminder for folks because they are seeing the invoice come through on you know the, the charge on their credit card every month. I want to push back on that one a little bit because that's a good point, but I think that there are so many better ways to get them thinking top of mind to your subscription. So for example, I subscribe to Book of the Month Club. I don't know if you have ever tried it, Robbie, but I, I yeah. love it. Um, One of the oldest and most esteemed subscription memberships in America, in the world, actually. I know it was like started in, in Europe, I think. Um, after I, and, and honestly, when I became a subscriber, it was because we were doing product research at Smarter and I was trying to find great companies. I had not heard of them yet. And now that I know what wide re reach they have, it's it's really an incredible business. Um, but they have the option to prepay. It's kind of the perfect subscription for prepayment because it is something that you're usually committing to. You know, you know that you're in a routine of reading or you want to be. But nevertheless, the thing that reminds me every month is not the credit card charge, but it's actually the email I get that says, hey, the new books have arrived. Here's where you are in our loyalty system, a summary, a quick snippet. And then it brings you directly to the option to customize your subscription box. Um, I love that I'm seeing Book of the Month fans in here too. Uh, I, know. I, Kelly. <laughs> I know, I like I like Kelly already. Um, I, we, should, we should touch base after this. But um, but yeah, I would, I would say that there are so many other ways that you can get the brand and consumer connected, that is not just the credit card charge. It's through a note from the founder. It's through a reminder that your subscription's coming up or that they can customize or that there are limited time products they can add to their next order. So I would definitely encourage everyone to be creative about how they're connecting with their consumers on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah. I think and this, obviously this topic on um, annual versus monthly always hits a nerve. Um, it's, it's a tricky one for people. Um, you know, here's another perspective from Dimitri. Um, two other considerations, customers may not be prepared to pay the annual sum up front. So this could be kind of a budgeting cash flow kind of question uh, or are more comfortable with monthly quarterly. Um, and, um, you know, depending on your your offering, an annual subscription may not be may not be possible. So I think there is a lot going into the decision of annual versus monthly. If, if I were going to leave you with something, you know, that hopefully is helpful, test it. Um, think about how your product is used and what makes sense. So, for example, if you do have a seasonal product, let's say that you have, you know, something that's around a particular sports season or a holiday season, uh, or maybe your product is, you know, takes your kids through the school year and it's not a summer product. Um, you know, think about a, an offering where you start by saying you pay for the nine months of the school year, but you get some fun stuff in the summer, too, plus these other benefits. So what that does is it gets them to commit to the ongoing cycle as opposed to them doing what Robbie does and putting a little note in that says, you know, June 5th, cancel subscription, September 4th, remember to re-engage because 
the, that, that second one, the remember to re-engage doesn't always happen. So if you can get them into the habit, um, I, I think that's, that's super valuable and probably worth taking a little hit on the, on the short-term, short-term profitability. Um, I don't know what you, what you think about, about that, Gabby. I a hundred percent agree. And I think you had the, um, you had the, the example earlier of a basketball membership and mm -hmm. sports are going to literally be the worst topic for me to speak to. Cause I don't know what, <laughs> and, and I barely know what kind of ball you use for any given sport, but to, to play off of that, Pun, in, pun intended, to play off of that, um, you know, there, there are some brands that are truly committed to one type of product, which I really respect. If it's seasonal, that 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 can stay. I, I understand that you are experts in one specific product. However, there are some exceptions I've seen that have totally transformed businesses. One quick example I'll give, an, an anecdote I'll share is um, we've had a couple of coffee companies come to us that have had struggles because either they sold regular, you know, ground or bean coffee, and then had a dip in summer because people wanted iced coffee or the opposite. And yeah. we, in some cases, actually worked with our brands during the process in which they evolved their product offering to have that other type of coffee. Again, this is a very specific example, but hopefully helpful. Um, and when they launched, they did do that as an option where basically with Smarter, we call it sequential subscriptions. You can have a seasonal product in place of its traditional. So maybe for summer months, you get iced coffee. And that totally changed the game on annual. It's like the least I want to think about is my coffee. And now that it's set up for me in my annual cadence, I don't need to think about it. It comes straight to my door, the right type of coffee for the right month. So that's just one example. Yeah. And that's really important when you're thinking about your subscription offering, when you're, when you're structuring it. You know, I think a lot of organizations make the mistake of just throwing a bunch of stuff into a box and calling it a subscription instead of thinking about, okay, I used to only have to have a one-time product market fit. Do you need this product at this moment? But now I have to have the product market fit on an ongoing basis. So you have to really go on the journey with them. And maybe the journey leads you to hot summer months where you want an icy cool beverage. Um, maybe it leads to travel in your summer months. Maybe it leads to, you know, for those of you that have educational pro products or, you know, teaching somebody macrame and you get, you know, you get wool or I don't know, the kind of string that you use to make macrame or, you know, you're learning sales and you're getting tips and books and things. A lot of times people reach a saturation point um, and they say, OK, I have enough now that I'm good for a while. And so at that point, if you don't change the composition of the offering, they're, they're going to cancel because you suddenly have lost product market fit, either temporarily and seasonally, or just based on where they are in their journey. If you sell, I remember, I mean, I've used this example a million times, but this woman that had a diaper subscription or a potty training subscription, I'm not even kidding, potty training subscription. And she said, you know, people are canceling it after two months. So I'm thinking that what I should probably do is require an annual subscription. And I was like, no, the whole point is if it doesn't, if you don't potty train your kid in two months, you're going to back off and come back later but you don't need potty training you know for for a year most people don't and so if you want people to stay for a longer time you need to have an offer that is going to be you know more of part of their ongoing life like a child rearing subscription that has products for you know these are products for you know getting you through you know eating solids and this is for getting you through diapers and this is for getting you through preschool and you know all, all the different stages but your, your forever promise has to be big enough to justify the duration of the subscription that you're hoping for. Um, yes. Incredibly. Yeah. 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 Let me look. There's a lot of, I, I really appreciate the comments and you can also, if you don't want to comment, you can also use the emojis to, 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 you know, like if somebody says something good or you like a comment to, to, you know, comment on the comments. Um, all of that is great. We love that. And it's great to see, you know, um, um, Alex from Catalonia and Sita from the Netherlands and Natalia from the Philippines, uh, David from Angola. Really great to have such a global community. Um, I see this question from Kelly, who's been participating a lot, which is awesome. Uh, love to hear your feelings about community subscriptions. Um, understanding that people's lives ebb and flow and not take it personally if they leave. So, you know, I think that's kind of what we've what we've been talking about. But but Gabby, I wanted to ask you, you know, some of the subscriptions that you support include an element of community. Some don't. 
Um, what are your What are your thoughts on the role that community can play in in um, in building uh, retention, especially you know from from the very beginning, keeping somebody engaged? Great, it's a great topic. Um, <clears throat> I think of community in a couple of different ways. So there's the very obvious influencer brands that leverage community as their main sales driver. I won't touch on that one too much because you have to have a really you know, famous influencer to have that be super successful right off the bat. But if you do have the opportunity to pair up with someone that has that built in community, that is we have seen time and time again, having the privilege of working with some of these brands, it just an unbelievable leverage point. You are not spending money on marketing. You're not spending money on ads. Really, you're you're using that channel. So that's that's one that is harder to get, but certainly one that is worth noting. The other is, I mean, let's talk about baby products as an example. The community of mothers or parents that can talk about the you know monthly subscription of Lalo kids toys and how each of their kids receive the toys and then maybe a picture of them playing with the toys that connection especially after what we saw through covid that connection online can be a game changer for your business because we now see that it's possible and not just possible but something that we we see really powerful um, as well is that ability to connect with people like you that are experiencing the same product and through that in itself, you are building value of your brand. And then obviously there are the more trick ways to, to get you know, benefits from community. So for example, giving consumers points every time they tweet about your product, right? That, those are easy lovers. But to the extent that you can build a community where you and your consumers are all engaging, that's, that's a dream. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I think, um, you know, a couple of points that you made that I think are, are really important. Um, one of them, the last thing that you said about gamification, like gamification is artificially rewarding somebody um, until they make a habit. Um, and the habit is, is kind of dependent on them getting the payoff from it. So, you know, you want me to participate in the community. You know that if I participate in the community, I'll actually get more value and I'll be more loyal. So you kind of pay me um, in, you know, in-house currency to do it. And then hopefully I get so much value from it that I'm like, I would keep posting even if they didn't give me, you know, currency points. Um, but it also aligns the goals of the organization with the consumer. But I, I think it's really important in gamification that the behavior that you're doing actually aligns with what's in, in the consumer's best interest and the subscriber's best interest. So yeah, I post, everybody tells me how cute my baby is. I feel really good. I feel connected. I don't feel as alone. I post about how hard potty training is. I get lots of reinforcement. Um, you know, Lalo gets maybe some new subscribers from me. Um, that's great too. But it's really about me feeling good as a as a as a subscriber. And you know, I see there's a question about. Um, I'm trying to remember where it is. This question about um, the the subscriptions. How do you keep them in, in a replenishment situation? I don't remember where I saw that question. Um, but the, the question on, um, you know, when you have a replenishment subscription, how do you retain them? Um, and, and I think community really comes into play here because again, they come for the discount, they come for the convenience, but it's just a commodity until you, you put in either community, content, something that is more than just, you know, I get my stuff, you know, I get my hair, my shampoo every month and I don't have to go to the store. I don't have to pick it up at the, you know, at the, at the store. Well, and, and a hundred percent and even more to that point, I can say even personally, I'm, I'm embarrassed to admit this about myself, but we also have a significant amount of smarter data that, that proves this to be true is consumers that are given a large discount on the first order or the first three orders they are not the customer you necessarily want. Um, I would be looking at payback periods. I would be looking at retention, A-B tests. Like Robbie, you said, testing is always, you know, 99% of the time I'll recommend you test something before you commit to it. Um, but the test, the, the challenge that comes with a large discount, it obviously impacts your LTV and your bottom line. Um, and maybe experiment more with when we talk about community. I mean, you you had great points around you know the community and feeling 
good and, and talking to other moms and expressing your challenges. But going a step further, at the end of the day, these are businesses, right? And so we're trying to grow these brands to really successful enterprises. And one way that we can do that is through community, thinking about referrals. If I feel a connection to that baby brand, again, I hate that we're, we're only talking about babies today, but that's that's what we're sticking with. Um, but if we feel that connection to the brand, whether it's to the community, just to the brand, to the founders of the brand, whatever it is, if I have a leverage point in which I am maybe incentivized to gift to other parents that I know, right? It's kind of, I don't know any parents on the line, but for me, it feels like I knew no parents. And now in this first year of motherhood, I know all my friends are parents. So it definitely is that built-in community that you can then bring to the brand. And as a member of a subscription, you're getting 15% off your next order or a thousand extra points for redeeming against loyalty. So there is a symbiotic nature there. It's not just the brand giving community to the consumer, but it's actually vice versa. You're improving your numbers. You're lowering CAC by having a community that fights for you through their community. Yeah. Yeah. Community is so powerful. I mean, I think, um, you know, when you're talking about retention, community is really important. Um, and onboarding is really important to establish those habits of bringing in, you know, there's a, there's a half-life on enthusiasm and people are going to be most excited. I think about your brand, excited and scared, right? I hope this works. You know, I hope that this actually helps me lose weight. I hope this actually helps me read more books or put healthier dinners on the table or whatever, whatever it is. Um, but I'm excited right now. And if I get a little inkling that it's going to work, that's when I'm going to refer my friends because I'm thinking about it. Um, so I'm curious what you've seen um, in those early moments of right after somebody signs up or right after they try your product. How do you how do you replicate that um, trying on makeup uh, at the counter in the department store experience that kind of sucks, sucks people in and, and forms habits? Absolutely. So one is and this is a little bit more of a manual lift, but it actually really helps with the first impression, but also with margin. Once again, I'll, I'll bring up margin. I'm, I'm a big GM girl, uh, special packaging. So think of the first order, you're getting tape that is branded. You're getting a welcome note that has a, a note from the CEO of the company welcoming you to the community or to the brand to trying the product. Um, maybe especially for earlier days of a brand's work, you have access to whether it be a phone number or an email address that they can text or, or, or email any kind of feedback, right? So you want to create that one-on-one -on -one relationship to the extent that you can. Again, that's not going to be possible at all scales, but technology really has come a long way and does allow for a lot of that at scale. So personalization in packaging and messaging, physical, is, is one really nice kind of surprise and delight, right? Another one that we see um, work really well is adding a little freebie into the first order. And that can be throughout the cycle. That could be as a surprise for a six month anniversary for a subscriber after a year of subscription. But that first time getting, you know, maybe it's a, a sample size or a travel size item of that makeup or of that shampoo. So that's another one. And then the last one that I'll say that works incredibly well is so underutilized is that referral channel. So maybe it's on the first order, maybe it's on the third. It can be a physical card or it can be an email so that it's lighter lift. You're not paying for the for the printing of it. Right. And it's an email saying, love our product. Here's fifteen dollars off. You can give to, you know, three friends. And in exchange, you get that same $15 for your next order. So those are just three, um, but I could go on forever. Yeah, no, this is this is great. I could go on forever. This is great. I hope, do you have a few more minutes? Can we go a couple more minutes? Um, okay, so um, when I say retention starts at acquisition, what does that mean for you? First impression is everything. Um, it's what I was, what I was taught growing up, uh, the reason I, was forced to get braces actually, but, but, you know, superficiality aside, it's what kind of experience are you giving on that first order? Um, that's pre-sale, post-sale. It's the email from the founder thanking you after purchase, but it's also the experience from checkout, right? It's, it's how easy was it to buy, how light of a lift and how easily does it integrate into your life? So that first impression has, you know, pounds of gold attached to it. Um, what we've seen 
unfortunately, as one of the major cliffs in which someone does disengage from the brand, churn as a subscriber, is after that first order. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just have a quick question. Is there anybody on this call who does not find that the first period is the major cliff um, for for retention, like the, that the most people cancel in period one? If, if you if there is anybody, I'd love to hear it. But I, I really haven't. I don't think I've seen any companies where that's not the case that, you know, most people drop off in the first period. I'm 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 willing to take that debate on that. That is <laughs> Every time what we see, especially Robbie, especially like 10 out of 10 times when you give something crazy, like 40% off your first order. Yeah. Yeah. The sweeter the deal, the more likely they are to cancel because um, they're not coming. So Muhammad agrees with us, which is which is great. <laughs> but if, if anybody doesn't agree, I, I honestly, I'm always trying to learn. And um, there's always special cases that maybe we, we haven't haven't thought about. Yeah. Tara agrees. Uh, first period is the major cliff. Um so yeah, and she loves what you're doing. Uh, Porsche does uh, an excellent job of keeping a customer for life, welcoming packaging, community immersion, gifts. Um, so that's a, that's a great and example. And I do think automotive is totally entering subscriptions. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I unfortunately, I unfortunately a don't have a driver's license. I never learned how to drive, and b don't have my 911 yet. But fingers crossed, oh, guys. <laughs> um, but what I hear is that there is like a club, right? You have, there's that Porsche club where you can go and drive with your local community. And that's exactly, that's a great example. Exactly what I mean. I would also bring up though, that tech has come such a far way that we can deliver a similar experience for every brand. It's not just the luxury brands that can benefit. So take that for, for what it's worth. Happy to chat with anyone about that offline too. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I encourage people to follow up with with Gabby if this stuff resonates with you, or if these are some of the questions your brand is is struggling um, struggling with. So I want to I want to wrap up. I, we could go we could go forever, but I want to you know give people a chance to get back to back to their their you know pile on their on their desk, whatever whatever's uh, on your plate. Although hopefully this was a little inspiration, a little fun break for us to hang out for a while. Um, I want to ask you. Um, if you had one big tip um, for people that are that are that are thinking about or in the process of building out their their Shopify store, their community, thinking about subscription, um, what would that tip be? If I can only say one, it would be: do not think that turning on subscribe and save will do something crazy for your business. It's not a you know, I'm getting a cavity filled and I never have to go back to the dentist again. That's not what we're doing here. That is a lever. It's something that you enable on your site, but you better believe you're thinking about that year round. You're thinking about, can I gift subscriptions? Is, is it something that I want to launch for holiday season, a six month giftable subscription and I buy it for Robbie and now that's a whole new acquisition channel. Do I want to give seasonal products a try? Do I want to reward my consumers that are repeating and uh, subscribing and becoming members? Do I want to give them something special? So it's it's definitely not a one button turn on. It's something that is really, hopefully we make it a lot easier for brands to do all of these fun things and to experiment like Robbie, you've pointed out, but it's, it's, it's not something that is, you know, teeth cleaning and you never go back to the dentist again, nor brush your teeth. You're, you're brushing your teeth nightly, hopefully. Right, exactly. And and the thing is, the difference, I mean, I think the difference in a subscription, if you're a dentist, let's say, and you're thinking about this right now, um, you know, dent, you, could, you could have people subscribe to, you know, dental teeth cleaning services, which I have suggested to my dentist several times because I come from a family of big plaque makers. And so we all like my my sister and my parents we all go quarterly to the dentist most people go every six wow. months um to get uh teeth cleanings but also you know toothbrushes floss like if you got that stuff sent to you on a regular basis and um you know new products and encouragement and whiteners and because the goal the forever promise is i want to have healthy teeth and a beautiful smile those two things right most some people it's a little more about looking beautiful some people it's a little more about health but it's somewhere for most people it's it's in that range and so if you think about packaging the offering to align with that goal that ongoing goal of the consumer 
suddenly you get all these ideas and that's how it leads to all the things you talked about. It leads to seasonal, it leads to bundling, it leads to community. Cause you're like, what brought them to me? Oh, they're a, they're a mom and they're lonely and they don't have friends who are, who are moms who they can talk to about this stuff. Um, they want to read more because they want to understand the world around them better and feel more, more educated, more literary, educate themselves. Um, I'm interested too, um, as we're, as we're wrapping up, if, if those of you who are, who are participating, if you can pop your biggest suggestion, I know there's, you know, I see, you know, a lot of um, subscription pros in the audience. So if you have a suggestion, something that, that has worked really well for you and you want to share it, um, you know, whether it's about monthly versus annual, or it's about how to onboard people, or it's about how to surprise and delight them, or building community, any of that, we we would totally welcome it. And I know people would appreciate it. it it's all going to be available um, after we're done as a as a LinkedIn uh, post. So people will continue to see the the good advice that you share here. Um, and and Gabby, if people want to find you um, or if they want to learn more about Smarter, um, do you have resources that they should check out or uh, any place that they should go um, if they if they want to get a little a little more of the goodness you've been sharing today? Of course. Um, first off, our team is amazing. Smarter.com is available and you can sign up for a demo if you'd like. But I'm also here. I'm a person. People don't always come to me directly, but I would love that interaction. So Gabriella at Smarter, um, I don't know if we can link that somehow, but I'm happy to go back and forth with anyone about their business and try to help. Yeah, awesome. Well, um, thanks everybody for joining us. It was a real it was a real pleasure um, to, to see you all and to interact with you all. I encourage you the next episode that I will be hosting uh, around, um, you know, subscription best practices is on uh, October 23rd at 11 a.m. Pacific with uh, Pavana Kumar, who is uh, a legal expert on um, the rules and regulations around subscriptions, who has been following the whole uh, Amazon drama. Uh, I don't know how many of you guys have been following that, but the FTC is suing Amazon for tricking and trapping subscribers uh, without their knowledge and making it very hard for them to cancel. So we'll be talking about that um, on October 23rd at 11 a.m. So please uh, please do register for that as well. Um, thanks everybody for joining us and, uh, and we'll see you next time. Yes, bye everyone.